and so what I will talk about is about coherent X-ray diffraction imaging at nanoscale. So as you know, I'm coming from DESI, and DESI is really a remarkable site with Petra 3 ring and with the flash holes, two holes flash and XFL uh, options. So that starts here and then in three kilometers, it, um, it has its um, um, playground place where we do experiments. So it's really a remarkable place now for coherent and ultra fast science. And I'm happy to be at, at that place. So about coherence, first of all. Well, we all know that coherence is, uh, can be presented in, in kind of two ways. So it's uh, longitudinal co coherence that, that is um, um, uh, all uh, about the wavelength difference and it's um, uh, related to the bandwidth of the light and special coherence that would be all the most important for today's talk and that is coming from the angular size of the source. And so coherent diffraction imaging, so it's coming from uh, um, partial coherent X-rays or electrons that can be, and then we pass by through the slits that uh, define our coherent beam. And then we put our sample, and then we could measure either in the forward direction or in the break direction, depending on the type of experiment. And then we hope that, um, and then we substitute optics that it would be, be between sample and CCD. We substitute it with phase retrieval and we hope to get to the fraction limited microscope. And as we all know, we are not yet there, but we very much hope to go towards there. So, and how we do phase? Retrieval, so it's typically we do a Fourier transform between real and reciprocal space many times, and we put reciprocal space constraints in reciprocal space, and we put real space constraints that are typically finite support and positivity quite often, and so some other constraints, and then we get hope. Hopefully, we get a result in this case. And in simulated diffraction data, we get, get it quite nicely. So we start with diffraction pattern, and then we put support, and then slowly uh, this face is coming of this nice lady with all the details on um, all, all the details about the hairs and everything you can see here. And it's so nice, of course, in the on the simulated data, but unfortunately, as you all know, that the process is going quite slow. I mean, from collecting data to real images it take, and publication, it takes sometimes two or three years until we, we are there and until we publish the results, because we have to understand also what is happening. And so now coherent X-ray sources, so it's APS, of course. It's a new ESRF ABS. It's Spring 8 in Japan, and of course, it's Petra 3 in Hamburg. And unfortunately, Dina, I don't have Max 4 here picture, but I should have have hit here Max 4 picture, of course. And so, um, but we do quite a bit of experiments now at Petra 3. And so here is a sample environment at Saxwax setup at P10. And then here also a sample area during experiment at P10. So it's here, you could see how, how it's all coming. It's X-ray beams, it's slits, it's sample. And then here's some microscopes we have, of course. And then the, the beam that, that is passing by to detector that is in five meters typically. So, and here it is a break CDI set, set up when we have our detector about two meters away from here. And here again, here, here is a microscope. And on this stage, we put our sample and B beam is coming from the right side. Okay, so now we go to nanoscience and we, I will start first from nanocrystals and the, that work was done in collaboration with Utrecht University and with Petra 3 team at P10. 
And you know that photonic crystals are quite um, natural in nature. So these nice colors in the wings for butterfly and this opal uh, samples uh, that, that uh, women like very much. It's the, these colors are c coming just from the fact that these colloidal systems. And Andre Zingema, my former PhD student, he studied just this uh, um, colloidal systems of the butterfly wings in uh, this paper. And so the, there are uh, artificial photonic crystals and uh, they can be made from 1D, 2D and in 3D. And uh, also importantly uh, that, that there is um, there are also photonic band gap materials. And uh, as we could see for certain frequencies, uh, light is propagating. So here light is propagating inside the system and at this frequency it's not propagated. So it's just uh, reflected completely totally. And also um, if you have defects in such systems, then we could manipulate light like here it is shown. So um, uh, having some um, um, distortions or, um, um, or, or, or some special defects where we can propagate light as shown here where we can turn it around by 90 degrees. And so here are different uh, de defects in colorable crystals and here is a CM image of internal facets of silicon and also. So, and of course, we will need good methods to visualize the defects inside the photonic crystals. And so, for that, we, we did the, the following experiment. So, and the, this is um, the, the way how people also at, uh, let me see here, is the point. So, uh, the, um, I, I, I have showed just before my talk that people in Brazil are just building up sucks beam line that would be devoted also for coherence measurements. And that's exactly what we do here. So we collect by CRL, we focus um, our beam slightly. So it's about a uh, few micron size focusing here we have. Then we have a cryojet to cool our sample. And then we have a carbon fiber on which we put our sample. And then we collect, as I said, in five meters, we put a detector and we collect uh, the um, diffraction patterns and we rotate samples. So it's kind of coherent tomography that, that we are doing. And so um, here angle is quite small of uh, rotation is 0.5 degrees and we can collect it from zero to 180 degrees, and in this way, we have the full reciprocal space. So now it's like that. So here, how, how 2D diffraction patterns looks like, you see how they evolve and how, um, so we have these break peaks that are also changing while uh, rotation. And also we have some streaks here, will it be at some point, I hope. You will see it now, we don't see it yet. And then you can put it into 3D in this image and here you can see streaks connecting break peaks. And so from that you could already guess that, that there are some defects, some plain defects in the sample. Okay, and so then we do phaser retrieval. And first of all, we will look on the break peaks, on this break peaks that is uh, highlighted here. And actually we average over six break peaks over three sets of break peaks. And so here is the break peak reflection. And after um, performing reconstruction, we get the shape of our sample in this case. And then we uh, using the shape um, as our support, then we can uh, reconstruct uh, use a reconstruction of the full uh, data space that was collected on, in 3D. And then we can obtain uh, this beautiful pattern that shows already, as you can see the layers of the colloidal um, crystals here, and also the propositions of all the particles inside the system. And so here you could see one cut through through the uh, 001 
crystalline plane, and you can see it very nicely. This hexagonal order that is very well seen here, and uh, also when we uh, and also where we could see um, staking, uh, ABC staking or ABA staking. That is the, the first one is FCC, and then HCP taking it quite often it's broken this or it's broken and then it's um, um, DDHCP is taken when it's ABC and then B would come there and if we project in this uh, direction then we can get the full taken so uh, you can see it's quite complicated here it's only here ABC 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 but, but otherwise it's all uh, different so it's Clearly, we have RHCP staking here. And also, well, what we can see here, we can see the, the double atoms or some vacancies here, as you can see here. So it's uh, really interesting to examine it at some point. Okay. So then, an exact second sequence is visualized. And then, of course, it's a question of the resolution that, that is very important. So on the de detector at that time, when we were measuring, so we obtained the maximum Q value, um, gave us a resolution of 56 nanometers. It is nice, but, but not so nice, of course, it's not so exciting, but we, we, could, we have seen that two colloidal particles with the size of 70 nanometers are well resolved according to Rayleigh criterion at distances um, uh, more than 18 nanometers. So that's already something not very good, of course, but something. But, but then we identified the position of each individual colloidal particle in the lattice was determined with an accuracy better than nine nanometers. So that is already quite a bit something. Okay, so, and uh, recently we continued to this experiment on a little bit different system. So it was not colloidal grain, but it was mesocrystal gold grains. So there is a paper. And so mesocrystals is mm, are structures composed of numerous small crystals of similar size and shape, which are arranged in a regular periodic pattern. And what is important that they're all connected with uh, some um, organic molecules. So typically it's long organic molecules. Typically it's also oleic acid. And so experiment was quite similar. So we have a source, we have CRL, but which we focus the beam. We have a sample and we have a cryojet again. And then we again, we were rotating our sample. And then on five meters, it was our detector. So then nanoparticles of gold were cubic shape, as you could see here. And the they were about 16 nanometers inside. And then we had such very nice cube, but, but it was a little bit big for our measurements. And so from that we, we um, uh, drilled actually in, in the middle, we drilled it with um, focused ion beams and we, we took a grain of this crystalline particle. And of course, uh, while um, uh, cutting it by uh, FIP, it, it didn't look so nice in the CM as we can, can see here. Okay, and so here we measured again reciprocal space, as you could see here. Again, we could see break peaks, and here fringes we could see from different facets of the crystalline sample. And we can see that there are some defects here because break peak is divided into two break peaks. And so he, here it's angular average, and here it's is that is shown here. And here again, reciprocal space in uh, movie. So you can see how it's changing here. Well, okay. And after reconstruction, so reconstruction was uh, made by Jerome Harness. And so here we could see results of uh, reconstruction. And here's some um, cuts from the uh, uh, here you could see some cuts through the middle of this uh, grain, and you could see here cracks, you could see here cracks and some point defects, 
and some lattice bending. So it's quite a complicated structure that was uh, removed finally. Yeah, but, but it's uh, important to understand the, this structure. And so you could see how, how it looks like, and you could see some ad atoms on the surface and some voids here. So that's quite important. And so then we made very careful analysis. So it's a, a displacement map with the red arrows is shown, a displacement map of 3D super lattice, where, and also you can assign um, by from a directly polyhedron, you can assign different type of structure in different parts of the sample actually. And then you can make also from that, uh, after you have the, the full um, displacement map, you can uh, map out map out a 3D dilatation map of this super lattice that is um, uh, some of uh, strain components uh, of epsilon x, x, epsilon y, y, and epsilon z, z. And you could see that grain is uh, really quite complicated, strained in very com complicated way. And here is just individual components here are shown. And you could see that it's really that strain tensor is quite complicated. But in importantly, after the, this uh, results, you can uh, obtain the full strain tensor. And here how gelatation map looks like in 3D. Okay, so saying that, so I will go now to uh, break coherent um, uh, CDI, and um, then so and this, as I said already, so you are coming to the same way with coherent beam. You put sample, but but now you measure your break geometry, and so here a few, few equations I put just for maybe kinematical approximation have. Uh, amplitude that, that is connected to electron density and this Fourier transform of electron density. And then as soon as there's a crystal, we put here periodically from density of the crystal. And then you can show the scattered amplitude near of one of the break peaks. It is given by, by this function where this S of H is a shape function that is equal to one inside the crystal. And zero outside the crystal. And what is important here is this phase factor that, that is projected strain field in the crystal. And so for crystallographic sample, we get uniform distribution of strain and that, that's where the, the whole method is going. And we know a lot of uh, people that use this nowadays. And but, but what is important to remember that in Red CDI we do not get information about electron density, but we reconstruct the amplitude and phase of so-called crystalline function associated with the given reflection. And th this would be clear from the examples that I will show just now. Okay, and here it's uh, in Robinson likes such picture also where he shows how this strain, this phase is appearing. So if we have lattice and then displaced lattice, and then it's shifted by this uh, deformation field, and that, that's how this phase is appearing. Okay, and also uh, sensitivity to, to strain will, can be shown in this model. So here is a, um, a in, in one model, it's just ideal lattice. And here is a lattice with some shifted planes. And you could see here, it's a really ideal copy of all the break peaks. And here, some deviations are appearing. And you could see here, for example, that is showing that it is not an ideal lattice. And this gives you an idea how you make in 3D uh, this measurement. So in this case, you just uh, rotate it around, uh, around um, your um, um, break angle, and then your CCD is passing by through the reciprocal space. And then you measure the full reciprocal space in this way. Okay, and so applications to catalysis and catalysis is a very important issue um, nowadays. And so um, uh, basically it goes by, by Arrhenius equation and by um, putting 
catalysis, we just change the barrier for some chemical reaction. So we lower this barrier, and that is important because uh, any uh, chemical reaction is governed by this RNA secretion. And as soon as your barrier is smaller, then your chemical reaction work faster. And so, as we know, increasing the rate of chemical reaction by lowering the transition barrier influences the kinetic or speed of chemical reaction. So here are some DFT calculations of different reactions. And of course, it's a big thing. It's a big factories that are built for that. And catalyst particles are quite small, some of them about one micron smaller, of course, about a few nanometers. Okay, so then present use of catalysts, it's cell light crystals and small hydrocarbons and, uh, um, and nickel particles and also platinum is very po popular. And so we, we made a few experiments here on, on that line. So it's coherent diffraction engine of single nano platinum nanoparticle that ran the reaction conditions. And this was done together with Andrea Stierle group and there's a nano lab and it was done at SRL. And so here are some DFT calculations uh, that, that shows how, uh, how platinum is uh, really reacting on different conditions and how elastic strain is evolving in particle inside the particle. And so we um, considered uh, different atmospheric conditions, argon and argon plus CO. So energy of the beam was 8.5 keV and beam size was 300 nanometers. Sample detector distance was uh, 0.68 meters. And here it was shown how to collect break peaks. And so here it's also, it's a dome here uh, where you, it's, um, have different atmosphere and here's a platinum particle in which you do your experiment. And um, so here, here is a diffraction pattern and then the phase uh, retrieval. And then finally you get your uh, reconstructed particle and here you see the gap. This gap is especially here, it is well seen. So then uh, what is the origin of this gap? It's just some part that uh, scatters in some other direction. It's not one, one, one direction where the, the most of particle is uh, scattering, but, but it scatters to another direction. So there are probably some stacking faults and due to that, uh, this part of the crystal is invisible. The electron density, of course, it's uniform. It's going from one part of the crystal to another part of the crystal. Okay, so, oops, back. Ah. So in argon atmosphere, here it was a particle in argon atmosphere and in argon CO, it slightly changes. And uh, then we could see the strain part. So here is, uh, uh, so shape is imposed together with the strain part. So strain is in color here as shown. And here you could see uh, to the images of the center of the particle in this direction uh, cut. And you could see this part that is not visible in other case and slight strain changes here. And so in, in order to visualize it better, we will put histogram of the bulk strain and histogram of the surface strain. And so here you could see that values are different. Okay, so then um, I will go to the second uh, paper, so it was gas induced segregation in platinum rhodium nanoparticles. And it was done in collaboration with Hoibe U group and Andrea Stille group in the nano lab. And experiment was done at APS of the beam line 44 IDC. And so here is uh, a CM picture of the platinum rhodium nanoparticle. And the small guys here, these are rhodium nanoparticles particles that are scattered around on the surface. And here is a diffraction pattern of this uh, particle. And here uh, the, the shape that was reconstructed. The reconstruction. 
And here again, we have different gas conditions. So it was helium initially, then it was oxygen of different concentration, 2.7% of oxygen, 5% of oxygen, and then 3.8% of hydrogen. Then, and we could see that in the hydrogen atmosphere, the shape started to change, and also here is a strain result, and also, and strain here is uh, um, um, uh, represented by the um, by, by the concentration of um, uh, rhodium particles, and so when it's red, it's more rhodium, so it's mostly on the surface, and it's depleted from the center. And the, this was the this results was the from five hundred fifteen degrees C, and here is temperature at seven hundred degrees C, and so the, this uh, temperature gives us a different um, pathland um, uh, for the rhodium particles for migration of the rhodium particles, and so we, we could see how how the, this is changing again in helium and oxygen and hydrogen atmosphere uh, and uh, so and we, we could see that we have a really certain segregation here on, on the surface of the particle of uh, rhodium and uh, this was even better revealed when we did a certain analysis so this is distance from the surface this is on the surface and this is going to the center of the particle and so here for hydrogen you could see for, for 550 degrees in hydrogen it has a jump here of rhodium and here at 700 degrees, it's more or less the, the same. And though in hydrogen, it is still a little bit high here. Okay. And we think that the, the following is happening. So that um, as soon as this particle were exposed to air, so then um, rhodium oxide is formed in the, this uh, in, for the small particles and for the big platinum rhodium other particle, it's all, all covered by rhodium oxide. In oxygen atmosphere, this oxide is becoming even thicker, but then in hydrogen uh, environment, it um, happening reduction of uh, rhodium oxide, and then particles start to uh, come to the big particle, and so here we have more rhodium. It's becoming uh, the, the surface of this particle is becoming rhodium rich. Okay, and the, the last experiment that I would be talking, it was a single alloy nanoparticle X-ray imaging during catalytic reaction. And the, this was in collaboration with Andrea Stiegli group at the Nano Lab and KIT in Karlsruhe. And it was done at ESRF IB1. And so here we started platinum uh, rhodium nanoparticles, as I said already. And so, uh, the position was 60 to 40 approximately of platinum and rhodium, and particles were uh, on steroid some titanate substrate size of the particle was about 100 nanometers, and we went immediately to 700 K. And here conditions were the following: so it was argon, then argon plus CO, then argon CO and oxygen, and then again argon and CO. Okay, and here is uh, CM. Uh, picture of the particle, and here is a wolf plot of the equilibrium shape of the particle, and you could see that it's very close to this equilibrium shape. Okay, so experiment was done about the, in the same way, like we do it always at ESRF, and here is 3D intensity distribution of the particle in 3D, and so then here it's a series for different uh, gas conditions of the, for the particle. And here, the cuts uh, shown here, blue, yellow, and uh, cut, and red cut. And you could see how it looks like. And clearly, we see that resolution in the vertical direction is much higher than in, uh, uh, in transverse direction. 
Okay, and then we made phase retrieval, and here is the result of the phase retrieval. So that's the shape of the particle that was shown, and that, that is shown here on 0.55. Um, 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 cut, so it was cut at 0.55. And here is a strain also shown at the same cut and value. And so you could see some evolution of the strain as soon as we're changing the gas conditions. And here we look inside of the particle and strangely, so we have quite a bit of strain inside the, the particle, uh, as you could see here, and also on the surface and on the bottom. And I think that, that is related to the um, effect of that. Uh, it's probably particle is stuck at some point where some defects are on, on the surface. Okay, and here it is very important. So we did, uh, where we performed a face facet strain analysis, and we could see how the um, changes are happening for different facets. So the, these are one zero zero facets, and we could see that here it's about the strain is about zero, but, but then as we change argon, or uh, so it's shifting here, we could see that in oxygen condition, it is shift, shifting to high strain values, and then it's, it's again relaxed and goes to negative strain values. And also here for, for one, one, one direction, so it first it's positive strain, and then it's more in oxygen condition, it's more zero strain, and it stays more like that in RCO conditions. And the, the same is valid for one minus one conditions. And here is surface and bottom particles. So these are the, the so the, the surface or, 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 or on the top and on the bottom. On the bottom, you can see that airbus are much higher than for the top uh, surface. And uh, but here we see opposite uh, uh, thing. So here it's positive and here it's big becoming oxygen. It's even more positive and then comes back and uh, Okay, and here an, an interesting point came out. So here we uh, tried to understand how, uh, what was a resolution for different facets. And then we found out this nice paper that was made at APS actually. And so then we performed similar analysis as in this paper and we obtained that um, we have resolution from five to six, seven nanometers and sometime above just three nanometers in the vertical and bottom condition. So it's very high resolution we got here. Okay, and in the end, I will spend a few uh, minutes about, and we'll talk about the fraction limited storage rings. And so, as you know, the brilliance is defined by this equation where sigma stays for the total uh, photon source size so that includes the horizontal and the vertical uh, directions. And that includes um, radiation from a single electron and size and divergence of electron ring. And then coherent flux is nothing else as uh, double half squared multiplied by brilliance. And then here we could implement emittance, for example, in particular horizontal direction. And then due to Heisenberg principle, uh, emittance is always higher than uh, double of four pi squared. And so if, if we get equality here, then we are so-called in diffraction limited storage ring situation. And how to, to get there is clear so that you have to minimize your uh, emittance from the beam. And that, that is a nice plot that, that is showing uh, the, how brightness is the, the same like brilliance, how it is changing. And so we have first generation, second generation rings, third generation rings. And now we have this 
uh, so it's here they were called alternate rings or diffraction limited rings that uh, have this uh, gain here and then for fields we have even bigger gain here and here what is interesting that it's related to the photon degeneracy parameter that is for one angstrom is calculated for one angstrom and you could see that if we have for uh, third generation rings it's about one percent then for the second generation uh, ring we have about two three probably and oh no no it's uh, so it's 10 to 2 so it's about 100 or 200 and here we would have 10 to 2 so then you could think about op um, coherent optics experiment Okay, and so we tried to analyze this. It was done in this work, and we have um, analyzed it very carefully with the XRT program that was um, very valuable for us. And then we understood that the symplotic limit for photon emittance is uh, uh, rather lambda over 2 pi and not lambda over 4 pi, as we thought initially. And you could see here how it, it symplotically coming here and different colors uh, means uh, different um, um, energy spread. So for red it's zero energy spread and then here it's one per mil and here it's two per mil. And if we look on the uh, coherent, okay, we can stop this button, I don't know. Okay, um, so if we look on the coherent fraction uh, that we could see that for 500 TV we reach really um, uh, will become two to one for coherent fraction. And if we have one pen per mil, it's a little bit lower and two pen mil is even lower, but, but still for 500 TV we are very close to the fraction uh, limit case. For 12 TV we are less diffraction limited, less at 24 and less at 50 kV, but we're still much, much, much higher than uh, at uh, Petra 3 ring, for example, where we have only 1% of um, coherence, in, in fact. So to reach diffraction limited hard X-ray emittance should be reduced to one picometer radian and below, but at, at the moment we are not yet the technologically. And here it is shown number of modes that were obtained here. So for 500 TV, it's about three, four modes that contribute. And we estimate contribution when it's above, um, above 1%. And unfortunately for 12 TV, we have already about from 13 to 20 modes will contribute to the beam. And as soon as energy is higher, then more and more modes contribute to the beam. And due to energy spread effects, we observe that more modes and reduced coherence will be happening. And so nevertheless, we are, be, we are planning to build up Petra 4 ring. And so it will cover tender to very hard X-rays and it's 6 GV electron energy. We are planning to increase the coherence fraction by two orders of magnitude. And the aim is for 200, uh, two, sorry, to, to 20 picometer radian horizontal emittance. And that's extrapolation of the present day techniques. And um, increase of number of underweight ports. So we plan uh, that we would have 35 underweight ports and 28 planned at the moment. So there are some free ports uh, left especially. And so we were planning to, to build an additional experimental hole that is shown here. So the, these are existing holes. It's Max von Lauer hole. It was the first hole. Then there were two, two uh, then there were two um, uh, extensions, yeah, north extension and sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, and here is additional experimental hole that is planned for, to build. And here is a, a time plan. So we plan, so we are now in so-called TDR phase that's planned for two years, about two years. So we finished CDR phase and we have CDR of the, of the project. And then 
um, we start uh, on, we plan to start on somewhere in middle of 2023. And then we have a duck time from 26 to 27. And from 27, uh, from 28 on, we start get a four duration. At the moment it's planned to like that, but of course it will depend on the politics and on many other things. So we'll see how it will go. Okay, so I'm coming to my summary. So coherent X-ray diffraction imaging is a revolutionary technique. It allows to emission forward geometry in 3D, non-periodic samples, colloidal crystals, mesocrystal angle grains. It allows to emission bright geometry in 3D nanocrystals under different external conditions, shape and strain you can obtain, and nanocrystals under catalytic conditions, and diffraction limited sources are especially well suited for this technique. And here are uh, members of the group like two or three years ago. At the moment, it's only three people in the group. And here are former members. That list is becoming longer and longer. And so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this overview on the technique and on the applications and the work uh, that you and your collaborators have done recently. So the session is open for questions, I hope. Uh, Actually, also newcomers to the technique can ask questions to even seeing that he has done some proposed some introduction to the technique again. Uh, you can use the chat, or you can raise your hand. I have a question about the. Um, you should uh, start uh, to hit up yeah. audience a little bit. Yeah. Yes, yes. I have a question about the, collo the colloidal crystals, actually. Um, I, I mean, the, the, you're, you're analyzing uh, micron size crystals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what is the information that you are hoping to uh, extract and how this can be useful then for real application? Well, information that we extract in this case. So, um, at a second. Oops, I have to share screen from there. Um, so, wait a second, I'll share screen back. And um, so let's see, colloidal crystals. So as I said, for colloidal crystals, it's really important to understand uh, this uh, defect structure in the crystals. And especially, you know, all these uh, defects inside are very important today because people are thinking about you using it for manipulation of this crystalline, uh, of these colloidal systems. And they were made by kind of simple technique when you put your glass uh, substrate um, into the colloidal solution and then by time it grows up and then it grows just by, by, by time and that's temperature control has to be very careful. And so the, this is a very simple technique, but, but you should be careful that all colored um, samples will be um, in a very small size distribution and that then it will work hopefully. We don't hear you. Yeah, sorry. Um, but in terms of uh, feedback, then on the onto the fabrication techniques, this is an important information, right? Right, right. The problem is that we have to uh, also. I mean, these are small samples that that we could investigate by this technique because we are. And that's actually a good uh, thing to think about. Uh, Petra 4, because at Petra 4, we would have coherence length much bigger than at Petra 3, and also the distances will be hopefully much larger, so that they plan like 20 or 40 meters for the hole for the for, for coherence scattering beamline. So in this case, we could measure a larger um, uh, larger uh, grains, and that would be very important because at the moment we just scratch uh, small grains from the uh, plate that, that is grown and just take one of them and study it. And so I, I guess it would it could go into some uh, larger samples and could, could be become quite important technique in future. 
Yeah, I see Dimitri. Please unmute yourself, Dimitri, and ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for a nice talk, Ivan. Um, I have a question, actually. Uh, maybe I just don't understand correctly. Uh, you, you showed the imaging of this mesocrystal. I don't remember what were the scales in all three dimensions, but do you do you have any problems with the longitudinal coherence? Um, um, yeah, okay. short, like shortage, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or it, or it's not applied in this type of wait, imaging. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. That that's a good question. So it's about few, uh, here is one micron. So it was about two, two, three microns probably I, I don't remember exactly the, the size but that's a good question so we should be careful with longitudinal coherence but luckily here we're measuring the forward direction and in the forward direction we are kind of more it, it's kind of more forgiving for us so from the point that in the break we have to be careful with scattering from the top surface and the bottom surface and it gives you certain patland uh, difference but but here as soon as we are in the forward direction so the patland uh, difference is given just by the thickness of the crystal and so and um, coherence is about two three microns longitudinal coherence here in this case. I mean, it's on a scale of single microns, right? So you need right, to right, consider right. to reconstruct something right. meaningful. Right, no. right, right, right. So it's about the, the same size. So we're kind of on the, on the safe side here, right? But okay. in principle, you are right. So if we will go for larger samples, then we should be more careful even in the forward direction because then we could have some uh, troubles in this case right but i think again in the forward uh, i i recall it that in the forward direction we are less sensitive to um um uh, longitudinal coherence so that's a very good case for us hmm. but in the break we should be extremely careful we, we can't uh, that that's why we were limited so that there are a few uh, things about why we are limited to let's say 200 uh, 500 nanometer samples because otherwise we have either diffraction effects or we have um, longitudinal coherence effects or some other effects that could uh, spoil our results as clear okay thank you i see you Nung. unmute yourself did you want to ask a question yeah, actually yeah i have a question for or him this page uh, by the way, it's a very nice talk. I, I mean, you cover many different aspects. Now, uh, in this slide, uh, two questions. One is, what is the real application of such uh, old major crystals? And secondly, these are all real. I mean, not really artifact, but the older small the particles on the surface is it real that is it yeah yeah it's real you could see it even here so i showed it in 3d yeah but, but you could see it also in, in this image you could see at nanoparticle so i think it's all real and all the cracks are real and this unfortunately it was quite damaged and i am I'm afraid that it was damaged uh, especially by FIP uh, that, that we used, you know, because initially, as it was here, initially you can see that it's quite a nice crystal. It was grown quite nicely, uh, but, but size was a little bit large here. You see it's 400 nanometer scale. So it was about, uh, yeah, probably a few micron size it was yeah and so yeah that, that was a bit of an unfortunate for, for us and that's why we took just central part of it and uh, looked on it in this way and then, then we could obtain all these uh, details and so here probably here and here we tried to understand this all by putting the displacement map and especially by calculating strain in all three directions. So here, how, how it was made. So our collaborators actually, it's, it was not our part of the work, but they took the average um, uh, structure that we determined for this uh, crystal 
and put, put it all in, in the center of the reconstructed grain and then calculated uh, uh, just shifts from this ideal structure to each position. So this red arrow shows this uh, shifts. And then from that, you can obtain strain in all three directions. So that's a little bit different from Brex CDI when we obtain strain also only in the direction of the uh, scattering vector. And so the, this is, I think it's very important uh, in, in future, it would be very important. But again, so it was a small grain and, and we continue the, this work. And so I think at some point we could come to some nice applications also. But is this good for catalysis or what? No, what no, is no, it? It, is, it is not related to catalysis, no, no. So. The, Catalysis, it was quite separate work and where, where we look on a single nanoparticles of platinum or platinum rhodium nanoparticles, it's absolutely separate. At the, at the moment, it's separate. I don't know. Hopefully in future, it would be also interesting to, to study this. Uh, but, and here, it's actually, it's quite interesting point here. So I could probably go back to the fraction pattern. One interesting thing we have observed. So when we have this six, 16 nanometers um, particles uh, that we uh, looked on, yeah, and so that they were cubic shape and they formed a cubic lattice, and you could see very nice uh, break peaks from this cubic lattice, and also some uh, fringes here coming from the surface. So it all worked here. But as soon as we looked on um, magnetite particles that were 16, one six nanometer size, then we failed to reconstruct. So we managed to reconstruct the uh, total shape, but we failed to reconstruct position of each particle. And so that is a good point really in order for understanding where, where, where the, the limits of the methods and where, where and why it was happening because break peaks were uh, on the minimum of the length on the minimum of the form factor. And so then we had uh, trouble to reconstruct properly. So I don't know, probably it, it gives natural limits for the technique. I don't know. Could it, could it have been the, the longitudinal coherence hurting you there? Because the 16 nanometer crystals would give very large. No, no, no. It, it is, no, no. It was 16 nanometer particles that were assembled again in the same way to, to uh, form mesocrystal. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and so the form factor of individual particle was having minima exactly at the position where break peaks were, you know, oh. that, that was, so break peaks were kind of lowered due to the form factor, you know, mm -hmm. and so that was uh, unfortunate in, in this case, and so that we have to keep in mind such kind of things. I see. But I... when particles are bigger, so that then we have a hope to reconstruct and to obtain uh, each particle position. And at some point you, you talked about the resolution of this image or was it the well, one of the other images? And, and I didn't quite understand the nine nanometers. Um, you, you said yeah. you located yeah. the particles to nine nanometer resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here, what? for for example, in this case, we calculated um, um, pair distribution function and we looked on the half width of the pair distribution function and we saw that uh, pair distribution function its sigma value is six nanometers even mm -hmm. so here we obtained even higher resolution as we understand that uh, that uh, positions of each part was determined with this six nanometer uh, on on average rms yeah yeah on average of course yeah. Actually, I find this uh, an interesting approach. I had a similar question on the colloidal. Um, I think you, you were talking about the resolution in the colloidal. Uh, so are you assuming that the particles are spherical for this? Yes, yes, uh, the particles are spherical. Yes, 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 they, 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 they were spherical, yeah. And they were quite large in size. They, they were about 213 nanometers inside there. So they were quite large. 
Yeah. And again, so as we have seen, so for large particles, when break peaks are closer, so that then we um, uh, have nice reconstruction. So for 60 nanometers, we also get the construction. But when we lower the size of particles to 16 nanometers, then we fail to, to reconstruct. Uh, and I don't know whether it's some, some generality in this rule or it's just was occasional. It's, it's th things to explore still. So Ivan, can you remind me again, why was the uh, resolution limited to 56 nanometers? It's like the scattering power. Ah, it was just really, really the scattering expensive. pattern. It was, yeah, so in this case, well, it, yeah. So TQ Max was just so that the, the, the text was an estimate of the of uh, resolution was giving us 56 nanometers. Uh, but then when we looked on the colloidal particles with, with the size of 70 nanometers, so that, they were, so that, that was an average size that, that we see here, that that was 70 nanometers. And then, so according to, to really criterion, distances should be about 18 nanometers. Then you resolve them according to really criteria. But then again, with nine nanometers, so that that was position of each particle in the crystalline lattice, you know, it was uh, uh, de determined better than nine nanometers. Actually, I think there is uh, an analogous in the, for um, scanning diffraction microscopy, if you have a very wide uh, peak in reciprocal space, uh, you can still uh, uh, evaluate the center of mass on the detector, even if it's over many pixels, and yeah, the sub yeah, right, 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 So right. it's very, it's very, very interesting. Right, right, right. Asos, I see that you unmuted yourself. Any yeah, questions? yeah, I have a question. You yes. initiated more questions by asking questions. So, um, I guess these pixels that we see come from, uh, originate from the scatterers, the individual uh, crystals, right? Right, right. So. Uh, if you just went and you picked one Bragg peak of those and you phased that Bragg peak, right. you would get uh, only one component of, uh, of the displacement. Um, um, yeah, so that, that, that's no. So if you go to one Bragg peak, so as I showed it here, so then, oops, sorry. So the, then you will get the shape of the, uh, the, the shape of the particle. Right. So if you go to one break peak that, that is shown here, then you will, after reconstruction, you will get the shape of the, the whole structure. Of the whole structure, yeah. Right, right. And then we used this as support to reconstruct uh, the, um, the particle. Uh, for already, the support. Yeah, yeah. So the, this was used as support. And then we used the full map in order to obtain uh, the, this already position of each color of the part. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if you, let's say, you, you show that arrow for the resolution. Right. Uh, that, that defines the resolution. But I'm, I was wondering if you got rid of a few break peaks, let's say. If you, if you what? If you deleted some ah, signal. Okay. No, the, that was the, the total scattering you, you see. So here, so the break peaks are here, they're small, but, but here it's the full, so detector was small at that time, you know, so it was maxi peaks, I think, and it was small detector. So you, as you could see that our break peak, so our scattering is larger than the, the part that, that is on the detector. And that was the, the maximum Q max that, that we see. Yeah. My question is, if you delete some signal from a few break peaks, have you tried the phasing that? And seeing if it works. No, we, we, we haven't tried it. We haven't. So I don't because know. you delete the center, from what I see, right? No, but, but, nah, so he, here the, there were some masks here, but, but then the, the, they were um, uh, recovered. So it was uh, um, intensity was uh, re rescaled here, and the, then it was continuous uh, in intensity here in the center. Also. Thank you. Any other questions or comment for Ivan? I think that uh, this discussion was quite rich.
And uh, I, I would like to thank Ivan again for the uh, talk and overview and everybody for participating to the, to the discussion, which is uh, the most important, interesting part of this. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.